go with nutrition and the disease process, so how it relates to diseases. And, but today we're going to talk about nutrition as we age. And any questions or comments that you guys have along the way, please speak up. There's not very many of us here, so it'll be a little bit more. So nutritional challenges as we age. So probably the one that I, everybody is most concerned about is that your energy requirements decrease. So how much energy your body needs to keep function, functioning, that decreases as we age for a couple different reasons. Um, our metabolism slows down and we have a loss of lean body mass. Those are probably the two biggest reasons that we don't need as much energy is your lean body mass, that's your muscle mass. And as you, we get older, that lean body mass automatically just starts to decrease, get, like, deteriorate. That's just what it is. And in turn, that means your metabolism slows down, slows down, which means that you, we don't need to eat as much in order for our body to just maintain its normal processes. So one of the biggest nutritional challenges that a lot of people face is, as we age is that we get overweight. We tend to gain weight and it's really hard to lose. Um, another nutritional challenge is chronic conditions can affect your nutrition requirements. So there's certain diseases out there, heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease, different things like that, they can affect different nutrition requirements. You might need more of some nutrients, less of some nutrients. Um, your absorption and metabolism of nutrients can change, can change depending on, on what chronic condition that you have. And usually these chronic conditions tend to hit us a little bit later in life. There's also drug-nutrient interactions. So as we get older, we get chronic conditions, we end up taking more drugs. Well, drugs affect nutrition <laughs> and some some drugs out there are nutrient wasting so they can make it so we lose nu nutrients for instance there's diuretics that help to get rid of excess fluid in your body excess water they a lot of them are potassium wasting um, you have if you are on an anticoagulant a blood thinner it can affect you know your vitamin E and your vitamin K intake so different drugs can interact with nutrients and that's a challenge as well as we get older. Then as you hit more into like your 60s or 70s, we have decreased appetite. Your taste can change. Things don't taste as, as good as they used to, which um, obviously changes the way that we eat. All right, so nutrients of concern as we age. Protein, omega-3 fatty acids, fiber, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, vitamin E, calcium, magnesium, and potassium. These are just a few of them, but these are the bigger ones that it seems like people hit. And I, it seems like there's a lot of those, <laughs> but as I kind of go over just eating healthy and how to choose a healthy diet, most of these are just gonna be taken care of anyways. So does anybody have any questions about those? Okay. Okay, so, and this slide is wrong, so I'm gonna apologize. <laughs> At the, um, out in Elwood, they corrected me and they were right. So nutrient density. So one really important thing that we do is we want to choose foods that are nutrient dense. So nutrient density is foods that contain relatively high amounts of nutrients compared to their caloric value. So they're high in nutrients. They're high in that protein, that fiber, those vitamins and minerals, and they're low in calories. Those are the types of foods that we want to be eating. This is the way that we counteract some of those challenges that, that I talked about before just briefly is that if you eat a lot of foods that have all of the nutrients that we need but don't have a lot of the calories, it's a way to meet your nutrient requirements while also dealing with that fact that we don't need as much energy, we don't need as many calories as we get older. So you can think of it as a seesaw, and you can see obviously the calories are in the wrong, they're in the wrong spot. <laughs> so the calories are supposed to be high and the nutrients are supposed to be the heavy ones, right? You want new, heavy on the nutrients, light on the calories. Okay, so the best way to do that is to follow choosemyplate.com. Have you guys seen this graphic before? Yeah? This is so, this replaced the food guide pyramid, essentially. And it's way better than the food guide pyramid. So essentially we wanna make our plates look like this. And if we do this, then we are going to be, most likely you're going to be getting eating a diet that's 
hits all of those major nutrients that we need, and that's lower in calories. So the first one is fruits and vegetables. You want to make half of your plate full of non-starchy vegetables and full of fruit. Your goal is five cups of fruits and vegetables a day. That's a lot. Five cups is a lot. Most people don't get it. And you want to vary your choices. So there's different vitamins and minerals and different antioxidants and phytochemicals that are found in all of the different varieties of fruits and vegetables. And there's five main colors out there. Can you guys think of what they would be? Red, green. yellow, green, Purple. purples and blues. No, no that's red. Yeah. Nice shot, yeah. So one more. This is the hard one. White, yes. Not many people get the white one. <laughs> so orange and yellows, reds, dark greens, purples and blues, whites, and tans and browns. So have you heard, like, eat the rainbow? That is the Skittles model. I know, like, oh, eat the rainbow. But it works for your fruits and vegetables as well. You want to eat the rainbow. You want to get a variety of different foods from not only within all the food groups, but also within the fruits and vegetables. And that's the way you're going to hit all of your different vitamins and minerals. So I want, like, I want something with faith. So let's, what are some, uh, some examples of foods that would be uh, fruits or vegetables that would be orange? Oranges, yay, that's lemon. Lemon, yes. Yams, sweet potatoes. Squash. I, I, vegetables and fruits. Okay. Carrots, yes, carrots are orange. Bananas. Okay. All right, what about reds? Watermelon. Peppers. Tomatoes. Apple. Eat the skin on the apple. Eat the red skin. Okay. Oh, not a fruit or a vegetable. And not naturally red, maybe. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Um, strawberries. Raspberries. Okay, they're red as well. Uh, dark green. Spinach. Brussels sprout. Broccoli. Kale. Yes. Broccoli. Asparagus. Asparagus. You have your dark green peppers as well, are right here. Um, fruits, grapes. There would be grapes. You could green grapes. And um, pears, if you green pear, like you could eat the skin on the pear. Okay, purples and blues. Blueberries. Blueberries. I think of any more. Plums. Eggplant. That's another one that's purple, blue. Grapes, blackberries. What about uh, whites and the tans? Not a vegetable. It is white or tan and not a vegetable. Can you think of any? What? Turnips. Onions. Garlic. Okay, leeks. All right, those are the white. So it's important that we just choose a variety of those foods okay, to hit them. Uh, one other thing I did want to mention, as you can see, it says non-starchy vegetables up there. So starchy vegetables are vegetables that have naturally just have a little bit more natural sugars in them. Most vegetables, or all vegetables, will have a little bit of natural sugar, but your starchy vegetables will have more of that sugar. So things like potato, peas, corn, your winter squashes, acorn squash, butternut squash. You almost have to think of them more like a grain, more like a starch. This says grains up here, but grains and starches are kind of, you almost have to think of them more like a starch. So you can still eat those or still enjoy those, but you want to make sure that if you're eating those, you're also choosing non-starchy vegetables, a ton that we just listed. Okay? Um, as well. And we listed, like, we've listed a lot. So you should be able to find, hopefully, at least one fruit and vegetable within each color that you like. All right. Okay, so the next one is whole grains. Aim for whole grains. 
You want to make grains and starches, that's with not starchy vegetables, about a fourth of your plate. That's about all you really need. And you want to limit high fat and high sugar choices. So your high fat, high sugar choices are things like donuts and pastries and crackers and muffins and fried rice. All right. Some of your cereals have a lot of sugar in them. Do you guys have questions about that? No? Okay. Um, half of your grains, you want to make them whole grains. So does anybody know the difference between a whole grain and not a whole grain? No? Okay, so what happens is when you, when you have a grain, so if you think of a grain of wheat, there's three major parts to the grain of wheat. So you have the outside part that's the covering. That's called the, oh my goodness, the bran. Yes, sorry, that's the bran. Then the inside part is the majority of the grain, and that's like the starchy part. That's called the endosperm. And then you have the inside of the grain, and that's called the germ. Okay, so there's three major parts. What happens is when they process grains, they take out the bran and they take out the germ, and they just leave the endosperm behind. Well, when they do that, they take out a lot of the natural oils that are naturally found in grain. It takes out a lot of the fiber. It takes out a lot of the vitamins and minerals, because that's where they live, is in that germ and that bran. So you'll see with certain grains, You'll, they'll have to be enriched. So they'll have to add back in the vitamins and the minerals that they've taken out. So it, you want to make half of your choices be whole grains. That way you're naturally getting all of those vitamins and minerals and essential oils that just come naturally within foods. So what is a whole grain? So whole wheat pastas, whole wheat tortillas, or corn tortillas, brown rice, whole grain cereals, oats, popcorn, whole wheat bread. All of that is considered a whole grain. And you don't have to eat everything a whole grain. Um, there might be a few things that you don't like. I personally don't like whole wheat pasta. I think it's yummy. So I don't eat whole wheat pasta. I eat regular pasta. But I make other whole grain choices within the grain group to kind of counteract that balance. All right. So how can you tell if something's a whole grain? So there's three types of bread here. There's sprouted wheat bread. 100% whole wheat bread and multi-grain bread. How many of these and which ones do you think have are 100% whole, whole grain? What? Do you think all of them are? The sprouted wheat bread and the 100% whole wheat bread. You guys think maybe there's two? Okay, <laughs> so. These are the food labels for them. So if you look, the sprouted wheat bread, the first ingredient, you see the ingredient list, is wheat flour. And then in parentheses, you can see it's enriched with all of those vitamins, B vitamins, okay? So that is not 100% whole grain. That uses processed flour, wheat flour from wheat, but it's been processed, it's not the whole grain. And then it adds those vitamins back in. And it does add, I mean, it does use some sprouted wheat that you can see right there, but it wouldn't be considered 100% whole grain because they've taken stuff out and now they're having to add it back in to increase some of that, that fiber content. If you look at the 100% whole wheat bread, what's the first ingredient? 100% whole wheat, okay? That's it, the whole thing. And then the multi-grain bread is wheat flour. Yeah, so, and then they have to enrich it again. So one of the best ways to tell if something is a whole grain is to look at the food label, to read the food label. And you can see the sprouted wheat bread and the multigrain bread. They've added things back in. They've added oat fiber and the sprouted wheat, and they've added things in to help increase the fiber content, increase the protein content. But if you want the whole grain, the 100% whole wheat bread is, is the only one that's got it. So read the food labels. You can't tell just by like looking at the front of the package. Yes. So why are you asking that you take out? Is it cost effective? A lot of it is is a texture thing, or uh, some, some like a lot of it is a texture thing. Sometimes it just works better to use um, white flour. I don't know if any of you have made bread at home, but it's really hard to make homemade bread with 100% whole wheat flour, it, 
It affects how it raises. It makes it a lot denser. And a lot of people like white bread. I mean, it's fluffy, it's light, it tastes good. So a lot of it is, is that. They use the white, they use the white flour because it, it rises better, better and makes a fluffier bread. So and yeah, it keeps longer. White bread keeps longer usually. And then they add it back in. But that's usually the reason why why a lot of people would use the white the white flour. I'm sure there's other reasons that I am not, like, don't know about, but, okay. Does anybody have questions about whole grain? What about cracked wheat? Cracked wheat. So cracked wheat, I believe, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that cracked wheat is, uses the whole grain. I think. I'm not sure about that, though, to be perfectly honest. I have to look it up. Well, it's cracked wheat, right? So, why is brown so much better than white? So the brown rice uses it's it's the whole rice. White rice is polished, so they they polish polish it off and they remove some of the the outer covering to it. And in doing that, they they strip some of the uh, so white the fiber is a and the fiber. Brown. What? So it's white rice a processed yes. of the brown. Yes. White rice is a processed. You do have, like, there are different varieties out there um, within white rice and within, there's, I mean, there's a lot of different varieties of rice, but, but the brown rice is considered, it uses the whole grain, like, it, it hasn't been processed. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is protein. So you want to make a fourth of your plate um, filled with protein. And with, with your protein, protein is beef. Chicken, fish, pork, eggs, nuts, legumes are on there too. Soybeans, okay, that all of all of this type of things. With protein, you want to make sure that you're choosing lean cuts of meat. So a lean cut of meat would be something that doesn't have a lot of extra fat in it. So it would, it's the white meat of chicken and, and turkey. It's chicken and turkey without the skin. It's beef. Uh, ground beef that's that's a leaner leaner ground beef. Uh, it's um, you know 90%, 85% lean at least. It's if you have steak or pork, like a pork chop or a steak, you want to trim the fat off of it, or steak or pork without a lot of like steak without a lot of marbling to it. You want to select lean cuts of meat, and then you also want to prepare it in a way that doesn't add a lot of fat. So don't fry it, don't pan fry it. You want to grill it, broil it, bake it, roast it. Stir fry is okay with a little bit of oil. And then as much as you, as much as you can, if you can do meatless a couple times a week, that's actually a really healthy thing that you can do. So legumes are on this list. Does anybody know what a legume is? Who heard that term? It's beans. Yeah, it's a fancy name. Yeah, it's beans. Black beans, pinto beans, garbanzo beans, chili beans, navy beans, all that kind of stuff. Beans, okay, not your green beans, but other beans. Legumes are, if you were to look back at that list of nutrients that are of concern as we get older, a lot of them, if you just eat beans, you get a lot of them, okay? There's some of them you don't get. You don't get omega-3 fatty acids from them, but a lot of them, a lot of those nutrients you get just from eating legumes. They're high in fiber, high in vitamins and minerals, low in fat. They're great <laughs> for us. So as much as you can add legumes and, and beans into your diet, that's a good change that, that you can make as you get older. And eating meatless is a great way to do that or just adding those in. And even you can even take out half of your meat and replace it with beans. That happens a lot. You can do that on salad. You can do that in soups. You can do that in um, on pizzas. You know, you can do that on a lot of different things. Do you guys have questions about that? No. So I was just saying. So I actually make I make pizza for my family at home, and I do black beans, and I just mash them up with potato masher, 
and like boil them to get some of the liquid out. I add taco seasoning to them. You spread it, you spread them on the pizza dough and you bake it with a little bit of cheese and then you put lettuce on top of it, you can put tomatoes on top of it, and then I mix sour cream and hot sauce and drizzle it on the top. But it, it, it's a pizza, it's good. It's really good. Or they use, a lot of people will use, <laughs> one of the things I've seen too is, is a white bean. I can never say this. The, I can't say it. The canna, cannelli, canna, I hope. Yeah, I can't say it. Canna, I can't say it. It's a white bean, but they mash it up and they put it as well on top of the pizza with a little bit of olive oil as a sauce. It's good. So on pizza, it's good. Soy, soy is another really good protein source. Um, soybeans, edamame is out there. Has, who heard, who's heard of edamame? Okay, edamame is a soybean. You can roast it and eat it. You can throw it in a salad. Um, it's, it's really, like, it's high in fiber, high in protein, low in fat. It's really good. Especially women as we get older, sometimes our hormones, you know, we have changes in our hormones level. Soy can, it binds the estrogen receptors in your body, so it can help to combat some of those problems that women face as we get older with the lower hormone. Okay. All right, so the last one is to add calcium rich dairy. Dairy is meat, is not meat, is milk, yogurt, and cheese, excuse me. You want to choose dairy products with no added sugars. So this is the big thing, um, especially when it comes to your yogurts, your flavored milks, your ice creams, puddings, that type of a thing. So the research now is showing how bad all of these added sugars are. So a lot of back years ago, they were doing, it was low fat, right? Low fat diet, low fat diet, low fat diet. Don't eat a lot of fat. Well, they took, so they took all the fat out of foods, but then people were like, well, this, is, this doesn't taste good. So they added a whole bunch of sugar to make things taste better. That's, for instance, when we talk about, when we talk to diabetics, one thing we talk about is you have to really be careful with your fat-free salad dressings because they've taken the fat out and they've added a whole bunch of sugar in it to make it taste better. And the same thing has happened with a lot of our processed foods. So with dairy, you just have to be careful that you're not eating a lot of dairy that has a lot of extra added sugar in it. Dairy naturally has a sugar in it anyway called lactose. And um, the more and more sugars you add, add to dairy, the, the worse it is for your body. All that extra sugar just isn't good for your body. It's harder to digest. It's, just, it's not good. You guys have questions about that? Well, exercise is a different, is a different story. Usually I don't recommend milk products for when you uh, exercise. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just because it's, it's harder to digest, right? When you exercise, you usually want a, a relatively quick form of carbohydrates during exercise. Um, but with chocolate milk, is you, can, you, you, you get a lot of sugar added to it. So for, regularly, for, for your regular diet, um, flavored milks, aren't, they're, they're just not, they're not good. They're more like a treat. They're more something you would have as a And for exercising, I don't know. Usually people don't well, just after. drink milk. <laughs> yeah, so after you exercise, you want to have carbohydrates and protein, usually. But some, And it depends on the milk that you're using. But a lot of times the flavored milks, depending on how, how much of it you drink, sometimes it actually has even too much carbohydrates. Milk, because milk naturally has sugar in it. So it's got 12 grams of carbohydrates per cup. Um, but so sometimes you can double that when you get flavored milk, even Especially, like stuff that's geared to kids has a lot of a lot more sugar in it. So you just have to be careful. Okay, so that's the dairy. But you need it. It's got calcium in it. If you have a hard time digesting dairy, you can do calcium fortified foods. Soy. We talked about soy. Soy. Um, a lot of times will be fortified with the calcium. The soy milk, the almond milk. Um, yogurt is usually a little bit easier to digest you have problems digesting dairy. Cheese is a little bit easier to digest. 
Yes. Okay, deal with like Greek yogurt. I know anything with added fruit doesn't have too much sugar, so I just say like plain menu vanilla yogurt. Good, bad. If it was good, then it's bad, not good, then it's bad. I mean, For the Greek yogurt? So Greek yogurt, what it does is it um, it concentrates the protein in it, right? So it's, you usually get higher protein with the Greek yogurt, and Greek, Greek yogurt is you'll you'll get more protein in it if you don't like it. It's a tart, it's more tart. It's a tart. I like it. Yeah. yeah, I like it too. But you get the same. You you could just eat plain regular yogurt um, without having the added sugar. So. I mean, it's a trade-off. Yeah, with Greek yogurt, you're better off, and regular yogurt, you're better off to buy plain yogurt and have it be, um, have you, you add your own fruit to it. You know, even adding a little bit of honey yourself is better than, than the sugar, the high fructose corn syrup, and the things that they put into the yogurt. That being said, if you, if you do buy the Greek yogurt and you try and buy the, the yogurt that's a little bit lower in sugar, probably okay, as long as you're making trade-offs within your other food choices. So a lot of it is, is trade-offs. So if you're going to do that, then that's fine, but then just make sure that maybe elsewhere you're conscious of your added sugars in your other foods as well. Or you can go back and forth. Did that answer your question? If I don't answer your question, you have to tell me. I guess you know it's good. It's, it's like it was the greatest thing when the first came out two years ago. It's the greatest thing in the world now. Greek yogurt? It's the, the one benefit Greek yogurt has is it's higher in protein. So, for instance, I, in the morning, if I get three servings of protein, so that's 21 grams of protein, I do a lot better during the day. I don't eat as much during the day. I'm not as hungry. I feel better. So, for me, Greek yogurt is a good thing. Um, and as we age, we find that we tend to, I, it, people tend to eat less protein as you age. So, Greek yogurt would be a good substitute for regular yogurt in that instance. Um, that, and it seems like when it first came out, there wasn't as many Greek yogurts with all of the extra stuff in it. But now there is. So now it's harder to find a Greek yogurt you know, that doesn't have all of the added sugars in it, where before it was, there was relatively few choices. So it is still a good choice. Yes, it's got more protein. That way it's a good choice. Calcium wise, it's about the same. Okay. So the other thing you want to do is choose healthy fats and we and just and avoid added sugars. So there are things there are fats out there that are healthy. You know, fats aren't this horrible, terrible thing that we're not supposed to eat. You know, there's fats, fat soluble vitamins, A, B, E, and K require fat to be absorbed. Fat helps us to feel fuller for longer. Um, you know, fat's not a bad thing. You just have to make healthy fat choices and then you have to watch your portion sizes with it. So healthy fats are your vegetable oils, your nuts, your seeds, avocados, fish, olives, all of those are healthy fats. And your solid fats are gonna be a little, they're gonna be unhealthier. And that's your butter shortening animal fats. So usually my rule of thumb is if it's solid at room temperature, it's solid in your that's kind of how you have to, that's how I think of it that helps and help you decide which fat to use. Okay. Major culprits of added sugar. I listed a whole bunch of them there. Um, a lot of them are processed foods. So a lot of the things that are processed are going to have more sugar in them because they taste better. So cookies and cakes, regular soft drinks, um, sweet rolls pastries, desserts, fruit drinks, even like fruit aids, fruit punch, dairy desserts like ice cream, sugar, syrups, jams, and jellies. I mean, that's just sugar and fruit. Uh, condiments, cereals, a lot of your ready-to-eat cereals will have a ton of sugar in them. Um, and then some fat-free and low-fat products. Too. So as long as you know that they're adding sugar to all of these things, it's just one thing to be aware of. So as you're buying them, as you're reading food labels, as you're grocery shopping, as you're choosing what to eat, you can choose these foods less often. Do you have questions about that? No? Okay. 
All right, so portion control. Um, especially if you have a chronic condition or another medical condition where nutrition and how much you eat and what you eat plays a role. And not only that, but even for weight control, figuring out how big your portions really are is really important. And you can measure food as you serve it. So instead of using a big like serving spoon to get your rice or your big serving spoon to get your mashed potatoes, just get out a half of a cup of a measuring cup and use that. And then you just put a couple scoops on your plate and you're done. And that'll help you to eat less, to eat less and control your portions. Use a smaller plate, bowl or glass. Uh, the mind is a powerful thing. If you choose a small plate and you fill it all the way full, your brain will think that you're eating more than you actually are. Versus if you were to put a big plate and the same amount of food in it, but it doesn't look like a lot of food because it's not a big plate, your brain will think, oh, that's not a lot of food. Maybe I'm still hungry. <clears throat> Had a water bottle. Okay. The other thing is to eat from a plate, not a package. So you're much less likely to overeat if you put things on a plate or in a bowl than versus if you were just to bring the whole bag of cookies out of the kitchen and sit in front of the computer or in front of the TV or the whole bag of chips. If you were to eat, eat from the package, you're a lot likely to eat more than if you were to put it on a plate. Start with a small helping and then eat slowly. Your bodies are designed to, when, to tell you when to stop eating. That's, that's what our bodies do. It's, it's a normal thing. So, but some of that depend, can be over, uh, we can override those natural body processes as if we, eat, if we eat quickly. So for instance, your stomach has stretch receptors in it and as it stretches, it sends a signal to your brain saying, hey, your stomach is getting full, stop eating. If you eat really, really quickly, then there's not enough time for that signal to get to your brain before you overeat. So then usually you've overeaten by the time that signal is, has come. Pay attention to feelings of hunger. When you're hungry, eat. When you're not hungry, don't eat. And don't eat until you're so full. There's no reason that we need to eat until we're full and you're uncomfortable. You should eat until you're satisfied, until you're not hungry anymore. It's not even the fact of being full versus, versus not full. When, when you don't feel hungry, then you should stop eating. When you do feel hungry, eat. Pay attention to your body let your, and let your normal, natural body cues uh, dictate, kind of dictate when you eat and how much you eat. And, and usually if you do intuitive eating, you, you know, your, your body will, they tell you what, what you need to do. It's, it's a good way to do it. Physical versus psychological hunger. Hunger. So, how many of you have heard of the teenage girl who gets a breakup and what does she do? She breaks up with her boyfriend and how does she cope? Ice cream. Yeah, she eats a pint of ice cream, right? <laughs> so that's psychological hunger, emotional hunger. You know, sometimes we eat when we're sad or we eat when we're bored or when we're in pain. And you know, every once in a while, it's that's okay. It's, you know, eating for a social or emotional or psychological reading. I mean, we, we reason we do that. But it's important to identify, be able to separate. Be like, no, I'm eating because I'm hungry. Or I'm eating be because of a psychological reason. And to make sure that our psychological hungers aren't overriding our physical hungers. So you can't let that be the norm. Or, or the psychological drives will have us eat foods that are high in sugar, high in fat, and, and overall, usually they're poor, poor like the pine ice cream. Okay, so portion distortion. This just lists how, how you tell about, like, you can estimate portion sizes. Two cups is about the size of two fists put together. Okay, this is vegetable-wise, two cups right on your plate. One cup is the size of a fist, like that. Half of a cup is the size of a small computer mouse. Okay. Maybe about like that. Uh, two tablespoons is a golf ball. That's about the serving of nuts. So think of it like what fits in the palm of your hand like this, not like this, but like this. Um, an ounce of cheese is about four dice, two nine volt batteries, three ounces of meat is a deck of cards, a tablespoon is a nine volt battery, a teaspoon is a small postage stamp. 
Okay, so putting it into practice. So these are just some examples of healthy meals and smart snacks um, that you can eat that would fit within the plate method. Just look over that. Can you guys identify maybe at least a couple of things that you can see? Or if you have any other suggestions, feel free to shout them in. Do you have any questions about that? Or suggestions or can you think of anything? No? Okay. All right. So the other part of eating of putting it into practice is you want to eat real food. So processed foods, as I mentioned, tend to have more sugar, tend to have less fiber as well. As much as you can eat real food that you have prepared it yourself, you know what's in it, that's, that's the best. Eat whole foods as much as possible. It's not realistic to eat whole foods all of the time, but as much as possible. Make treats and desserts a real treat. So I am a big proponent of all foods can fit. I think all foods can fit. I think on your birthday, yeah, you should have cake and ice cream or pie or a donut or whatever it is that you, you like to eat on your birthday. Um, I think on the 4th of July, yeah, have that cupcake, have that steak, have, you know, whatever it is that you eat. But you want to make it a real treat. You don't want to make that an everyday occurrence. You don't want to make it even a weekly occurrence. Um, but, but know that you can have those types of foods. You just have to do it in moderation. And as well, it's a trade-off. I know we were talking about this earlier. You know, it's a trade-off. If you're going out to dinner and you know that you're going to go out to dinner and you're going to get the pasta or you're going to get the steak and the mashed potatoes and or you're going to get dessert, then balance your food choices earlier on in the day. Have a salad for lunch. Have, you know, uh, lower calorie, nutrient-dense foods earlier during the day and that will help to counteract what you're doing in the evening. So it's all about, it's all about the act. Eat with a purpose. Um, don't mindfully eat. Don't walk around and just kind of snack and graze and not think about it. No, when you're hungry, eat. When you're not hungry, don't eat. Eat what you like. If you fill your fridge and your pantry full of foods that you hate and foods that are gross, you're not going to eat it. Choose foods that you like. Start off slow. You don't have to like overhaul your whole fridge and pantry right at once. But find foods that you like and, and eat those foods. Like I said, I hate whole wheat pasta. I'm not eating whole wheat pasta. I don't even buy it. But I do like other things. Okay. Be adventurous with your meals and snacks. Don't be afraid to try new foods. Um, print off a new recipe a couple times a month from the internet and give it a shot. <laughs> okay, but also, yeah, also be adventurous. So I like to try new recipes. Some of my recipes have been, oh, they're so terrible. But I've tried them, and I know that they're gross. <laughs> and sometimes I make, what did I make? Curry. I'm just going to say it, and you guys are going to know it's gross. Pineapple curry quinoa <laughs> with chicken. Yeah, it, well, it sounded, it sounded really good. Oh, it was so terrible. We had pancakes. We ate it, and I was, my kid, anyways, we ended up having pancakes. But I, I tried, <laughs> and I failed. But then we've also, I've also tried some things that have been really, really good. So try new things. Don't be afraid to try new things. Um, and then listen to your body. So I, I talked about eating with purpose. Don't mindfully eat. Listen to your body. Give yourself permission to not eat when you're not hungry. You've had a big lunch. You know, it's one of those days you went out to eat, you had best food for lunch, but you come back to the office and somebody has a treat, they have donuts, they have something else, and you're not really hungry, you know, you can give your, it's, it's okay, there will be other donuts. Give yourself permission to not eat. Listen to your body. That was the end of the slide, yes. Yeah. So 
when you're craving, um, like, I mean, I can use a personal example. So sometimes when I go on vacation or something or we go to baseball games or we go do something like that and we eat and I eat out and I kind of just snack and I eat a lot of high carbohydrates, a lot of high processed food. For the next few days, sometimes I'll want a salad. Like a salad sounds so good or fruit, that apple sounds so good. Your body wants, your body can tell you, yeah, that you're missing these nutrients. You need to eat it. You feel better when you eat it. Your body has a way to do that. That's different. <laughs> That's a little different. It's okay to sometimes be like, yeah, I'm craving that. But, you know, cravings are interesting. So the studies that show that when, like the sugar, so when you eat foods that are super high in sugar and they do the brain scans on them, they light up the addictive parts of your brains, right? So it's, it's the same part. So they can, like foods like that, though, can become addicting. And it's sometimes because they're addictive, it's, it can be hard to just stop. It can be hard to eat a cookie and be like, oh, I think I'm still hungry. I think I'm going to eat three, four, five, six more cookies. So you have to do, try and do something to break, break that kind of a craving when it's high fat, high sugar food. And usually if you step away, if you have a glass of water, if you wait 15 to 20 minutes, a lot of times that craving will go away. You'll be like, yeah, you know, I'm not really hungry. So it's listening to your body, but also you do have to yeah, be smart about it. Know that know that, that can happen. So is it better to like stop cold turkey when you have an unhealthy craving like that? Or is it better <laughs> to substitute it maybe with something else that has a healthy craving but not to be high in fat and sugar? So that depends. Is if you're if you're really hungry, like if you're honestly hungry, then but you know if you're, if you're honestly hungry and you want cookies or you want donuts or you want crackers, then yeah, if, if it's a physical hunger, it's better to, to make a better choice, to, to make a healthier choice than it is to eat that. But if it's more of a psychological hunger and you're eating it because you're bored or because you're there or because it just sounds good, um, then yeah, it's better just to not eat it at all, not to eat anything. And that's hard because that, that differs for every person. And the foods that are triggered like that, that, that trigger us to eat and keep eating and are a little bit more addictive, that's different for every person. So it's, that, that kind of a thing is hard. It, it takes, you have to really know yourself and start to be in tune with, with, with what makes you tick and, and what your habits are. And the more you get to know yourself, the more you can come up with like coping strategies to deal with that. It's because so it's hard, it's all so the other thing that's not on that slide that I wanted to address really fast is exercise. So as we get older, our metabolism slows, lean body mass decreases. We really, you need to exercise. You need, you, it's, you just, you need to exercise. It's important for your heart, it's important for your muscles. Strength training twi twice a week will help to keep that lean body mass and, you know, keep, keep burning calories. Your muscles burn calories. The more lean body mass you have, the more calories you burn throughout the day because the higher your metabolism is. So if your doctor okays it, you have, you know, obviously if you have some chronic conditions or um, other medical conditions that you're dealing with, you need to check with your doctor first. But exercise, we need to exercise. Feel better, good mood, mood booster, but it's also important for uh, maintaining our health as we get older. Do you guys have any questions? No? <laughs> Is it because you're on camera? Nobody wants to ask a question when they're being recorded. They oh, they can't. Oh, and I forgot to repeat the question. I'm sorry. When there were questions. Yes. I have more questions. Okay. Yes. Okay, so the, I have to repeat the question. I remember now. So the question is, is if 
you crave carbohydrates and is it because of an activity level or you play a lot of sports? How do you kind of curb that? So with, with the carbohydrates, carbohydrates are tricky and a lot of people have a hard time because carbohydrate, they crave the carbohydrates. It's, they like the sugar. So one of the things that you can do is you can just try and make sure you are eating fruits and vegetables. And you can, if you're active in sports and you play a lot of soccer, then you are going to need more carbohydrates. Carbohydrates aren't bad. Our body uses them for fuel. Your nervous system, it's glucose is the preferred fuel. I mean, your brain needs glucose. It has to have glucose to function. So um, if you're active a lot, then yeah, eating more carbohydrates is, is going to be okay. And if, if that's what you feel like your body needs, and then I think that that's probably okay. You know, you can try and, and cut back and eat more fruits and vegetables and eat more protein. Sometimes if you eat more protein with your meals, eat more fiber, that can help to make it so you're not quite as hungry. But you have to, that's one of these things that you just have to listen to your body. So if you, if you eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and you're eating high fiber foods and you're eating protein, but you're still hungry, you know, you cut back on your carbohydrates, but you're still hungry and you don't have very much energy, then you just might be one of those people that needs more carbohydrates. You're active, so active that, that that's what you need. So as the exercise papers off as we get older, it's a lot simply be more conscious of those foods that you're eating possibly too much of. Yes. 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 So as you get older, you have to be conscious of the foods that you, you know, when you're younger and you're moving a lot and you're active and you're involved and your metabolism is higher, you can eat more of those, those foods. But as we get older and our metabolism slows, you have to cut, cut back on, on those types of foods. Any other questions? Did that, did that answer your question? Sometimes I feel like I answer questions, but I don't really answer the question. Yeah, obviously, like, I, you, your eating habits as a 16, 20, 25-year-old, once you hit your 30s and then your 40s and then your 50s, they do. They, they have to change, even if you're really active. They have to change. And sports nutrition is a whole other, like, gambit. That's, you know, you need – sports nutrition is its own thing, and you have to make sure you're getting enough – more, like, enough carbohydrates and enough – all of a sudden, you talk you, – instead of – talk about, oh, you have to eat less. It's, oh, maybe you need to eat more when you deal with sports nutrition. But yeah, you have to be conscious as we get older. You can't, I mean, you can't eat like you're 16 anymore. You can't eat like you're 25 anymore. It just, or you'll gain weight. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah.